one of the most amazing things about the whole experience was creating the pilot and that it was a real, it was a TV movie, it was a full length film. Mace, I know I got one of the best planes we've built, but whatever this guy's got, I want one. When we started talking about different directors, um, we were talking mostly about pretty traditional, respected but very traditional TV directors. People that had done some good right. episodes, but that had done maybe a, a big pilot or a movie of the week kind of thing. And um, we had some good meetings with people, but we never felt like we found the person who really got the material. So at one point, we were looking for lists of names that would be approved by the network. And I think I just floated, well, you know, I mean, I know Toby Hooper. I mean, you know, he's done some, some great stuff. What about him? And he was put on a list, and suddenly it's like, yeah, if you could get Toby, that'd be great. And I just, I remember I called him up and brought him in, and he was like one of the first directors that came in and, and got it both kind of viscerally, where he just loved it, and then he started talking about, you know, what I would want to do is I'd want to work with this DP, and I'd want to do this, and I'd want to use the Godfather palettes, you know, and I'd want to come in and... And he, he had this vision of, of what it would look and feel like. You tell me, Mr. Longard. Does this look Russian to you? The prequel to the Toby meeting story, though, is we had had one nightmare meeting from hell with a director who I, I don't actually remember his name, but I believe he was one of the A-list directors of, of television in Hollywood and, and had some great track record. And this guy came in, and it, it, it minced no words. He was going to rewrite the whole script. And, uh, you know, we'd probably be lucky if he would let us stick, you know, come to the set kind of thing. It was, it was, I, th we, I think we both walked out of that one. Th this is a, a looming, horrific disaster. And yet it was a viable thing because he was a big name. And then Toby came in and as Brent said, uh, Toby was very respectful of the material. He came in and said, I've read your script twice. And he said, I, I don't want to change it. I want to m get it on film. And so when he walked out, I think we both said, okay, how do we get Toby the gig? Yeah. Because it, it's the only way to preserve our vision in any way. Yeah. It's natural to fight it. But by now you know where this must end. Hello, John. Toby Hooper, he's the man. He's a legend. Uh, you know, I certainly knew who he was, and he's such an unusual, unique individual, and he really created such an appropriate vibe. The guy's such a visionary, and he, he just, he's so good at, at, you know, getting what he wants and, and the look of it and, the t and communicating what he wants. He was always in for collaboration. Uh, he was very supportive and very creative. He was explained himself really well, and he never put a pressure on the actors to do something that they didn't understand. I had always wanted to go to him and say, hey, you know, any, any notes, you know, the, the after, after we do a take, and, and I go, hey, Toby, you have any notes? And he'd be thinking about the shot, and he'd go, ah, oh, yeah, and you have a cigar, ah, oh, yeah, ah, um, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 all right, let's go, roll camera. And he would like, he wouldn't even give me direction, he'd just give me this kind of, yeah, 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 that's, all right, do that. And it, like, okay, and then, you know, I look over at JT or whoever, they'd go, hey, you know, this is what it is. He's very cool. He was very much a product of the 60s, very much. Um, and I think it helped us all. I think it really did to have somebody who had the experience but also the ease. You know, it was a high-pressure environment, and he, he always calmed me down, at least. You know, with Toby, he came in and, and he saw little details. You know, he, he said, you know, we're going to shoot your script. What I'm going to find is little opportunities to just give it extra texture. I remember one specific thing um, that I just love about the pilot is the crop circle scene. And I remember we went scouting, sure. looking for places to do the crop circle, and we found a, a ranch up in Newhall or up near the grapevine somewhere. We walked around, and we were looking for the specific site and kind of thinking, where would this look good from a helicopter and whatnot? And he said, let's do it here, and let's run it through the fence. 
I've never seen that before. And I said, really, that just seems weird. And he goes, no, think about it. And then we'll have a shot where we can like see that the wires were melted. And you go, wow, I've never seen that in a crop circle before. And, and he said to me, he goes, you think aliens care if there's a fence there? You know, and I just thought, well, that's, I see, I like a director that thinks about those kind of details. And just then when I remember watching him frame that shot where he's looking at Lone Garden, he's racking focus on the little melted ends of the fence and putting those little details in. Those were the things that he got really excited about, finding his little ways to put kind of his signature on our story. You see any strange lights in the sky over the last month or two? Wow, you seen some? My God, this is amazing. The stalks are laid down perfectly. And it looks like they're woven together. It was 47 minutes long in its first cut. Yes. Right? I remember just hearing that and saying, I think I, you've... Uh, that <laughs> that can't be right, right? Because forty seven minutes long is that that's you don't just trim out a few things. No. So there's all kinds of wonderful things that were in that original pilot that uh, that never made it. The I have a dream speech right. we recreated in fifteen degree weather, and I think it happened in August. And yeah, it was very hot. So we would literally be prepared to shoot. People would drop their jackets, he'd call action, they'd act, and then when cut happened, everybody grabbed their jackets and, and, and tried to warm up. We would like tape, tape and plastic bag our feet because we had to stand on the grass all day long and it was frozen. Like it was frozen, it was supposed to be spring. It's again, movie, magic of movie making. That scene, because we were so long, is not in the pilot. That was lost and then the, the White House tour. The, the Jackie Onassis White, White House, House tour. tour. They actually had me accidentally walk in on Jackie Onassis while she was giving a, a tour of the Oval Office and I, it was amazing. They actually had me walk in and she looks at me and I go, oh, I'm sorry First Lady and I walk out. It was the kind of thing where we went back and we found a moment in Jackie's tour where she just for inexplicably looks back like someone had said something to her off screen and so we filmed, you know, Lowengard looking for Sayers and he you know, kind of <laughs> opens a door in the background. Oh, whoops, I didn't know this. Was it looked pretty there. good. And it looked like absolutely real. Boy, that shows the desperation of how long we were. Yeah. You've got to be substantially long to have to cut moments like that out. That cost a lot of money. Yeah. It cost a lot of money to shoot that. We shot that first full original pilot in 1995, and that was edited, and that version literally aired overseas. And as we were going into production on fresh episodes. Our edit room, as I recall, was next door to an edit room for the MIB movie. Yeah. And there was grave concern that our men in black were called men in black and wore black suits. Men in black are historically a well-documented entity of you know, government agents who wear black suits and they do mysterious things involving aliens. Well because this other movie had men in black, we needed to have men in dark gray. I'd written a movie that was produced for the Sci-Fi Channel that had men in black in it. I'd written a Lois and Clark episode that had men in black in it. You know, it's like men in black out there in the zeitgeist. But when I made this argument to one of the executives who shall remain nameless, that executive came down to the set and had lunch with us that day and said, if you don't get your guys out of the black suits today, we will shut down your production and burn the negative. So we had to get everybody out of black suits. Uh, we had to colorize some of them. Mm -hmm. We had to reshoot numerous scenes to get them into different colored suits. We had to not call them men in black, so we called them cloakers. Mm -hmm. We came up with new terminology. It could have been a complete and total disaster, but we sort of decided that if we were going to reshoot scenes to simply get a guy out of a black coat into a brown coat, to simply reshoot it exactly as we had done it before might have been interesting for film school, etc. but that we had perspective that we hadn't had before. We'd had a year to, to work with the project, and we knew our characters better, and we knew where we were going better, so we actually made a few changes here and there. And I'm mixed to this day between the two. There are things about the first one that make it better, and there are things about the second one that make it better. My wish was always that we would have been able to create a hybrid version, where we took the best of the right. first version and the best of the second version and had the definitive cut. Um, Except you can't do that because the suits won't match now. Yeah. Yes. 
Absolutely. John, go get one of those containers over there, will you? Damn it! Look at his face. He threw it in his face. Put it right there. Put it there. Go on, keep pulling it. Don't damage it. It was a testament to everyone involved that we were able to actually survive that. We lived to fight another day, and, and I'm glad we did, because we made 20 hours of an exceptional series. So we're a, that's how you got to look at it. Sir, you're bourbon and seven. Thank you. Making a series with sci-fi elements and historical reenactments is one thing, and it's a, quite another thing to make it set in the 60s. There wasn't a, a ton of digital effects in it. There wasn't really even a ton of stunts. Mm -mm. A lot of money went towards costuming, set design, you know, and going to practical locations and redressing them. You need cars. That was something that really started impacting how we could tell the stories because we had to really, we'd write a draft that was fairly ambitious and then it would get you know the reality check by the line producers who would come back and say okay well I don't know where we're gonna shoot this or we don't have this location and towards the end of the season we started working in closer collaboration with them to say hey this is what we've got coming down the pipeline can you start looking for locations now so we can start writing to them a little bit because that was always a challenge is how much of our budget are we gonna spend just doing a walk and talk scene on a street that has to be completely redressed. John, this has to be a mistake. They said he was never in the hospital, no, Jesse. No. no record of him at all. Balfour and Jesse were setting us up. John, John this, listen, I can feel it. This is real. No, I know Kim it is. said it. It is too good to be true. Open it and John, see. John, John, 17 years. Every background actor who came on the show and every guest star who came on the show had to get a haircut. They used to have to set up a base camp for the hair and makeup department because people looked different. And you can't come in with inappropriate hair. It completely throws it. So every guy got a haircut. And women all came in in their rollers. I have to imagine that each department, when they got this script, you know, just got excited. They're like, this is going to be really fun. I concerned myself a lot about hair and underwear. <laughs> One of the most important character traits that I had to learn was from, was actually from the costume designer, was that everything about my character started from the underwear up. So I was given a Playtex bra. Women don't wear Playtex bras now. But just that little detail was so inspiring because as an actor, the, m the more you have structurally to put yourself in, the the easier it is for you to then present the character within the circumstances. You don't have to manufacture those things. Excuse me. Mrs. Lincoln? Hi. Good morning. I'm Kimberly Sayers. I work for Alicia Burnside. There was one advantage, though, when you set the entire series in a time period, so for the 1960s, it's not like we were a regular episode doing flashback scenes to the 60s mm -hmm. and have to challenge everyone to accomplish that. Every member of the cast and crew knew we're in the 60s. That's where we live. From the minute anyone started, from set design to simply getting the cars, the decisions you made in the first episodes paid off dividends in relationships and so forth in the later ones. You look at our last episode, for example, Bloodlines, and it's just chock full of all kinds of great looks and things and we were on a very strict budget at that time and yet it's one of our richest looking most powerful episodes because everybody was smarter everybody knew where to push who to ask a favor for how to how to get it on there so sticking with something that allows you to do it well I think it also helped that we shot here in LA. There's still a lot of vestiges of the 50s and 60s that can be found here. Whereas a lot of shows that shoot in Vancouver, it's very hard to find right. that kind of Americana look and feel. So that was a huge advantage. And I know that that was even considered at one point, was should we shoot this in, up in Vancouver? That was very trendy at the time. Um, but because we shot here in LA, we had a pretty wide palette of 
you know, cultural kind of icons around the city that we could lean into. Yeah, I got a 502 on Avalon and 118th. I need a car to take me. Oh, come on, officer. You're not going to arrest me. As an actor, while I'm working on it, my favorite stuff was when I was actually in a scene where we were reenacting something historical. For example, you know, walking along the Potomac with Bobby Kennedy. It was one of the few times in my life as an actor where I really felt transported to that time. I really felt like, it, you know, I was in H.G. Wells' time machine and had just gone back and here I was. Nothing suspicious, but I did get to see a rehearsal and meet one of the Beatles. Which one? John. John Lennon? I'm sorry. He's He's my favorite. Hey, Jaws pretty good. At the end of the day, it was mostly a casualty of business and politics. What was difficult was how competitive the field was, even though there were so few shows like it. Uh, and I think what was most frustrating for all of us, I'm sure, was the comparison to X-Files. And we weren't X-Files. The only thing we had in common was that it was about aliens. And they had a very hardcore, loyal following. and. So as any, you know, hardcore loyal following would do, they were very protective of their show, which meant that they had to then hate Dark Skies because that yeah. we were just seen as a ripoff. That was very difficult, I think, for all of us to sort of say, just watch the show and then you'll know we're not the same show. You can like it or hate it on its own merits. That's the great mystery of television. I mean, the shelves are full of series that were like that that just, you know, didn't get that their, their chance. And, Unfortunately, I think sometimes maybe it's the money and they start thinking, man, this is pretty expensive. We're not getting the numbers we want. Maybe we got to pull the plug instead of going, you know what, let's go one more season and really see if we can really get that audience. It's unfortunate, but that's, that's what happens. The other thing which I think any self-respecting producers have to do is complain about their time slot. Yes. Um, let's do that. Yeah. I think in this case it was fairly legitimate because 8 o'clock is still family hour and you watch Dark Skies and it's anything but a family show. But it's also the, the slot that's most vulnerable to preemption. So it's the hardest one to keep an audience. By the way, we got slammed by a lot of parents groups and family organizations for being way too violent for an eight o'clock, right. as if we made the choice, you know? Which is interesting. There was a UCLA study on violence in television done here that we were on. And we were listed as the most violent show on television in terms of being inappropriate in its time slot, yeah. which I guess you could argue at 8 o'clock, they specifically highlighted the ART of Jim Steele in episode one as being a particularly violent moment in, in, in television. But they did duly note at the end in this report that the reason it was inappropriate was because of its time slot. <laughs> A lot of time has gone by and as an actor you do your work and you let it go and you set it out because you don't have control over what the fate of it, you really don't. And that's a hard thing to reconcile, but it is, it is inevitably the, the truth and what, what will happen on any show. But to have people continually and consistently remind me of the work that I did in the past is, is very flattering. You know, you think, hey, I'm a part of something that's going to never go away. You know, I mean, look, we're here, we're talking about it. Uh, what, 14 years later? And um, a lot of people are gonna discover it. I mean, I'm hoping my kids will watch this series and I think they'll dig it, you know? And it'll be fun to talk to them about what was going on during this time. But you know what's funny is that my son is obsessed with any show about aliens. He loves alien creatures and I just sort of chuckle to myself. And I've been reviewing them and I'm thinking, oh, I can have my son watch this. No, it's a little too scary. <laughs> It was scary. Like I was watching something. My daughter walked in, who's four, and she was like, what's happening to you? Mom, I don't. Stop. Leave the room. You don't need to see Mommy cough up a ganglion. You don't need to see this. <laughs> Unless maybe I want to threaten her when she's 14 or something. You see how angry Mommy can get? <laughs> you have to let me go, John. Not yet. 
Okay, really, it worked. Not yet, Kim. I'm sorry, I just can't. I hate you! Let me go! I'm not you talking. Don't you still feel to this day that it's a miracle that we did this? It is, and I hadn't seen the show for, mm -hmm. for years. When I went back and watched some of the screeners, I was shocked at several things. A, at the level of production value we were able to get on a weekly basis, but B, that a major network let us put this on. I mean, this wasn't FX or this wasn't a Friends cable show. This was primetime NBC, and it's a very subversive show. And I'm still shocked to this day that this was allowed to go on. At the end of it all, even though it's not identical to what we put down in the briefing book that we sold it with, the vision of it is still about 90% of what we thought up in that office in 1994. I guess our thing to the fans is if you like it, we're thrilled. And if, if you don't like it, it's our fault because we got to do pretty much what we set out to do. Yeah, absolutely. My name is John Lowengard. I'm recording this because we may not live through the night. They're here, they're hostile, and powerful people don't want you to know. History as we know it is a lie.